we want to do, we wanted to do this um, program on Daniel Kahneman for so long. This is just how does the winner of the Nobel Prize in economics become so extremely important to trial lawyers? Uh, it is an amazing book. I, I've read that book. I, it is so dog-eared. I was saying last night, if my Bible were nearly as dog-eared as Daniel Kahneman's book, I'd be in probably a lot better shape. I wouldn't know as much, but I'd be in better shape. But there, when you're modeling your case, when you are designing your lawsuit, there are a couple of factors that you might want to take uh, into account that, that come from so social psychology. So I'm going to step away from Kahneman for a minute, and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about social psychology. This gentleman, Fritz Heider, uh, in 1985, he said, "Behavior engulfs the field." That's an extremely important phrase for us. Behavior engulfs the field because the fields that he he was talking about is that he's talking about the fields of observation. Behavior engulfs observation. In other words, what we see, what we watch, is much more important than what we, what we hear or see. I mean, here are the vocal tones. So the other is the fields of perception, how we perceive things. Behavior dominates what we perceive. So behavior dominates observation and perception. And most importantly, when you think about it, when the jury's in there three weeks later in the jury room trying to remember things, behavior controls constructive, reconstructive memory. So when they're trying to think back to what the case is about, what the evidence is about, they think first about behavior. When jurors attribute causation, they look at two different factors, the personality or the parties, or I just like to say the word circumstance. The circumstances versus the personality of the parties. And this is important to us. It doesn't matter what kind of case it is. So let's look at this. Um, personalities are in the foreground. They look more at the personality of the parties involved and the personality of, the, uh, of your witnesses and the people carrying your load, evidentiary, than they do the circumstances and the situations. This is a very big detriment as a general proposition to plaintiffs because of tort reform, because they have jurors believing before the case starts um, that the, it's a frivolous lawsuit, that the plaintiffs are just, just there to get money, that it's just greedy trial lawyers. So the personality picture going in is against us, but we have to turn it in our favor. The situations are in the background. Now, the this gentleman here, who's very, been very, very helpful to this organization, Lee Ross is a brilliant, brilliant uh, social psychologist from Stanford University. He's a PhD there. He, he made this observation. It's called the fundamental attribution error. In other words, what is the basic mistake that is made by jurors or anyone else when observing uh, a conduct? Obs the, the fundamental error is that they attribute causation primarily to personalities and secondarily to situations, just what we're talking about. The, and he says that that is a mistake. Now, Lee has worked with Dave Winter at this organization. In fact, I gave this speech once when Lee, Dr. Ross was sitting in, sitting in the audience. Remember that in New York? He, he was sitting in the audience. It's, it's wonderful to give a speech to a PhD from Stanford telling him what he really meant by what he wrote. But uh, uh, the, the other part of it is observers attribute causation primarily to personalities and secondarily to situations. So it's the same, it's the same concept. Now, the anti-plaintiff bias makes this disadvantageous to us because of suspicion, the mistrust, all these things that, that uh, we've been hearing about in the tort reform for so long and in the jury bias for so long because they believe it's the fault of the plaintiff coming in. Uh, and the anti-plaintiff bias makes it disadvantageous because of personal responsibility. Because again, if they're looking at, if they're looking at the, uh, the person, if they're looking at the conduct of the person rather than the uh, background. So the funda fundamental error comes down to this. He defines it as internal causation. 
Internal causation is what comes from inside the person. It's the person's characteristics. It's the person's actions. It's what is the type of person that would, that would take this sort of action? The external circumstances are external causation. This is very important because generally this is the conduct of the defendant. This, this gets clear as we go through it. The internal causation, jurors overestimate, overestimate the influence that are, of a party's internal attitudes. Look at this, it's the personality traits, the characteristics. So proving up the, proving up the personality traits and the characteristics and the type of person that your client is, is extremely important. So you have to prove your client up to the jury through the client, through the family members, whatever. You have to prove them up to be a reliable person, a believable person, a person who would not uh, have been causative in the conduct that you're examining here. They're not the type of person that would have tried to speed up to make that get through that yellow light. They're not the kind of person that would, that had the person, that show the personality traits. So you have to, uh, you have to be very careful that to understand how important the perception of your plaintiff is and you have to overcome the adverse perceptions going in. So you have to stay far as, as far away as possible from any possible concepts of this person being greedy or this person over overreaching. You know, we have a tendency to overtry our cases and the younger you are, the more you have the tendency to overtry your case because you're afraid you'll leave something out. And so if you're overreaching and if you're claiming far more than you're, if you're claiming far more than you're proving, then that's reflecting badly on your plaintiff because the plaintiff is the one that is making that claim. So a fundamental way to get around this is, and I've said this many times, try the case you have, not the case you wish you had. Don't overtry your case because you play straight into this jurors overestimating and taking a bad perception on your, on your plaintiff when you do that. Uh, attribution to personality, external causation. Jurors underestimate, underestimate the effect of external forces, situations, or circumstances as an influence of causation on damages. Now, when you have, a, when you have an automobile accident, 18-wheeler, what is the external causation? The external causation is the truck driver. The external causation are all the other factors outside of the plaintiff, outside of the plaintiff's control. So if, if they're underestimating the effect of the situation or the circumstances, the external forces, that highly benefits, highly benefits the defense. So our job is to bring out very clearly how important the external causes are, how important the uh, the 18 wheeler driver, the action of the 18 wheeler driver, and we'll get to this more. This clears up in a minute. Okay, information overload makes it more likely a juror will blame the plaintiff, and that's part of the fundamental attribution error. Giving too much information, information overload, again over trying your case. Now, that's not to say don't give information. You do give information, but you give the right kind of information. But you, you give the right kind of information about the type of person that your plaintiff is, and you show while the plaintiff's on the stand or while the family's on the stand, anyone else is testifying, the, the nurses can make, a good, can make good witnesses as to the type of person that this uh, plaintiff is. How did they respond to treatment? How did they respond to, to the... Uh, physical difficulties they had. The, the therapist can make great, they can, can make, uh, the physical therapist can make great witnesses about the kind of person. And you want to portray your plaintiff as a person with great courage. Uh, you're not trying, never try to elicit sympathy. If they think they're a person, if they're in there trying to get sympathy, you're going to play straight into this, this concept, bad concept. So you're going to try to convey your plaintiff through the medical testimony, through the doctor. The doctor can testify how brave they were, how courageous they were, how, how well they responded to, uh, to the very big task that they had in front of them, the rehabilitation. Uh, and the, the doctor can make a great witness on the thing you should be proving about your plaintiff 
which is courage. Portray them with courage, but also make sure that you portray them with integrity. And integrity comes back to you. Don't you make them look like a person of low integrity because you're claiming a lot more than their case is worth. That's, that's on you, but it hurts the plaintiff. So the, on the burden of proof, we're, you have to negate the influence of the personality of the plaintiff. But remember, when we come to this whole thing about, about personalities, there are two personalities in the case or more. The defendant also has a personality, the defendant truck driver. So you want to attack the, or enlighten the jury with respect to the aspects of the truck driver's personality. You want to prove that through his personality, he is exactly the kind of person who would speed up to try to make that light. He's exactly the kind of person who would choose to drive 70 miles an hour in a 55 mile zone. He's exactly the kind of person who uh, is, would be irresponsible. So it's, when it comes to personality and circumstance, it's not, it's not a one-way street. It's not personality of the plaintiff versus circumstances of the defendant. It's personality of the plaintiff versus personality of the plaintiff, of the defendant. And then it's the circumstances. And remember, here's the best part of circumstances. Almost always, the defendant creates the circumstances that the plaintiff finds himself in that leads to the injury. So the circumstance, if the circumstance is critically important, but they go back to the original proposition, fundamental attribution error. They're putting it in the background. They're putting circumstance, the bad actions, uh, the bad actions and the circumstances that were created by the conduct of the defendant, all things being equal, the fundamental attribution error says in establishing causation, the Jurors will put that circumstance, that bad conduct of the defendant, in the background and put personality in the foreground. That's why this is such an extremely important topic. It applies to every type of case, personality versus circumstances. So you want to focus on the influence of the, of the personality of the defendant. Is this the kind of person who would drive at this rate of speed? Is this the kind of person who would follow such reckless conduct? Is this the kind of person who makes bad, and the, one of the most important words in litigation, who makes bad choices? Choices, it's all about choices. So um, you stress the influence of the circumstances as they bear on the actions. And remember, stress who created those circumstances. That's what it's all about. Put, a lot of, put in a lot of evidence, a lot of conversation, a lot of cross-examination about precisely what the defendant did that created those circumstances. And compare it. Remember, everything is compared to what? We're always comparing it. We talk about this, but compare to what would have, what would have occurred if the defendant had acted properly. What would have occurred if the defendant had done what a reasonably prudent driver would do under the same or similar circumstances and slowed his truck and applied his brakes and stopped before he got to the red light instead of running it. So that's your comparison to what? But it's by bringing, the whole objective is to bring circumstances into the foreground. Bring the defendant's personality into the foreground. Put the plaintiff's personality as being a, a, an attribute of the plaintiff. Overcome the bad thoughts about plaintiffs. Overcome the preloads that, that they bring with them to the courthouse. We have to do that. Um, and then you show the circumstances, examine the circumstances of the plaintiff. How much of this did the plaintiff contribute to? And you have to be willing to accept it. You have to be willing to say, examine closely, ladies and gentlemen, the conduct of Mrs. Jones. We invite you to. May as well invite them. They're going to anyway. Examine it very closely. And then compare the conduct of Mrs. Jones in creating the circumstances that brought about this tragedy. Compare it to this animal and what he did. Maybe not. But comparing it to the defendant and what was his, what were his conduct, what was his conduct that contributed to the circumstances. So it's all about 
personality versus circumstances. So, the, uh, now we get to the different types of attribution. And this, this again, this is, both of these attributions are so very much in our favor. We just have to take advantage of them. And you can't take advantage of them if you don't know about them. So that's why I'm here. Purposive attribution. The social psychology tells us without any doubt that the jury will more likely find negligence or whatever you're asking them to find, gross or whatever, if you show that the conduct of the defendant was done on purpose. Not, that is on purpose. That is not intentional. We're not talking about gross negligence here. We're not talking about a wanton, wanton willful dis, uh, disregard for the rights of others. We're talking about he acted on purpose. What does on purpose mean? He chose. He chose to drive this way. So you need to stress, it's called con control conditions. This is control conditions. Who created those conditions that caused the tragedy? And in doing so, look, stress, stress over and over from in as many different ways as you can, the choices made by the defendant and every choice is a purpose, is made with a purpose. So by showing more choices, you're showing purposive conduct and you're showing the safe, on the other side of that coin, you're showing the safe purposive conduct on the part of the plaintiff. So, purposive attribution, extremely important. And the more purposive attribution you can get, uh, and more choices, more bad choices that were made by the defendant, which led to the tragedy, then this exacerbates damages. This is how you kick up your damages because if you start showing enough of these bad choices and you don't have to get to, you don't have to, get to punitives, you, but you can, there's an irritation factor that kicks in there that increases the damages. And this is what focus groups tell us. Defendants' bad choices, and this is what you always want to stress, extra, go into detail about what exactly the de defendant did that created the circumstances. So we got to put the circumstances all over the defendant. He created them, he created them purposefully, and his creation of them is what caused the whole tragedy. And, <clears throat> and it was his personality traits. Now, here's the, other, here's the other attribution bias, which is, again, in our favor. Reactive attribution says that the jury may even excuse, may even excuse negligent conduct. May is the operative word there, but they will be much more tolerant of negligent or less than perfect conduct if you are, if the person, if the actor is acting in a reactive situation, if they're reacting to something that was imposed on them. So why is that good for us? Because in virtually every case, we are the reactors. The plaintiff is reacting to a bad situation created by the defendant. The defendant creates the, the bad circumstance. They try to run the red light. They do whatever. They create the bad circumstance. The plaintiff is reacting. So you want to stress this. You have to point this out to the jury. Compare their, their choices that created the situation to my lady who was simply reacting. She did the best she could when she was thrown into this dangerous situation by the conduct of the defendant. Reactive attribution will get you forgiveness. Okay? And, and this, this takes away, there's two things. It takes away from the possibility of comparative fault, and it also places all the fault back on the, on the defendant. So that's reactive attribution. Plaintiff is simply reacting to the bad choices of the defendant. Um, okay, egocentric attribution, uh, people always seem to, they, they, um, they would analyze things in such a way that they attribute more 
good to themselves than other people would attribute to them looking at it from an external viewpoint. And that comes into play on this. Defense, it comes into play on, on the next attribution, which is defensive attribution. Defensive attribution is a trap. It's a trap for you and me in representing the plaintiffs. And the reason it's a trap is because it's counterintuitive. When we're looking at jury selection, we're looking at a panel. And it's very easy to look at this. And I'll tell you very briefly about a, an actual case where I saw I had this thrown right at me. I represent a woman who was home with her kids on a holiday. And all the kids in the neighborhood were playing outside on this holiday. And there had been a very bad rainstorm. And the, the, what had always been their playground for decades had suddenly become a construction site where they were building uh, part of the interstate highway system in Beaumont. And when the, con when the contractor left for the weekend, uh, they just, or when they left for the holiday, they left all these 30 foot deep holes where they, was, where they were sinking post. They left all these holes out there, unguarded, no fence around them, nothing. And when they did, the, kid, the big rainstorm came and all those 30 foot holes became 30 foot deep traps for kids. Kids all over the neighborhood are playing there. Uh, one child, her, her son, 11-year-old uh, son, was out there with a 5-year-old kid and all the kids are around and the 5-year-old kid falls in the water. The 11-year-old dives in to try to find him, can't find him. The 5-year-old drowns. The 11-year-old stays, he gets trapped. He keeps trying to save his brother and he ends up brain damaged. So you have a brain damaged child and a dead child. Now, the, I did a focus group on this. And what I found, now, here, before you get to that though, so you see a lady here who is 30 years old and on your panel. She's 30 years old and she's got two children. And your normal thought might be, you know, this lady would identify, she's gonna be a good juror for me because she would identify with the loss. She could identify with what, how horrible it would be to lose two children, or to have one brain injured and the other one dead. So she's gonna be on my side going in because she'll, she'll identify with my client. That's wrong, and that's why it's counterintuitive, and that's why it's a major trap. Because the fact of the matter is she's probably the worst juror you can have on your case because of defensive attribution. Because what happens is this. I did a focus group on this, and my lady was, um, was the family was Vietnamese. But, so I did a focus group on this, and I got this response that all they wanted to talk about, I had 18 people on the focus group, and there were some men, some women. It, wasn't, it, it was a mixed group. And I noticed that the women kept talking about the mother the conduct of the mother, the men kept talking about the contractors the, and, and the, the, what they had done wrong. And so, so I did another focus group. And in this focus group, I brought in 24 people. I brought in 12 men and 12 women. And I presented all the same presentation to both of them, and then I divided them up into two separate rooms. And the women went in one room for deliberation, and the men went in the other room for deliberation. And what I found, I mean, there was no question about it. The women never, literally, never once mentioned negligence of the construction company, even though that's what the case was about. They talked about nothing but the conduct of the mother. That's all they would discuss. The men, on the other hand, not once, not one single sentence about the conduct of the mother. The men actually came up with some very good things because some of them work construction. They came up with some very good ideas about things that the construction company had done wrong. So, and what was the whole, the answer to all of that was defensive attribution. Because defensive attribution means that the women were looking at her and they were saying, you know, she must have done something wrong 
she had to do something wrong that caused this. Because if she didn't do something wrong, if she's totally innocent, what? That means it could happen to me. That means it could happen to me. So to defend themselves against the, even the thought that this could happen to them, they will attribute fault to her. So that's defensive attribution, and it's a trap. So be very cautious of it when you're doing, um, when you're doing board examination and when you're exercising, exercising your strikes. Um, and it's especially true uh, when you're looking, when they're looking backwards uh, in a hindsight bias to that also, because now they're looking backwards at that, saying, you know, well, I would have done that differently. So you have a combination of defensive attribution and hindsight bias uh, and the egocentric bias. So uh, think about that when you're looking at these uh, people who are similar to your, to your plaintiff. So uh, now the other, the other aspect there, I just flipped by, was the in intensity factor. The more serious the harm to the plaintiff, the more likely they are to apply defensive attribution because they want to push it further away from them, okay? Um, the next thing uh, is the, I got that, okay. This is, this is very true. My, I'm so excited to go and jury. When's the last time you ever saw that? Um, Okay, so the self-serving attribution, jurors who attribute causation based on what serves their own perceived best interests. This, this is the target. This is what the defense is looking for. They're looking for tort reformers. And how do they reach out? They, they raise the issue that their own best interest is to not award large money damages to a plaintiff because what? It's going to raise their insurance rates. It's their own perceived best interest. So these are the people that say, I don't care if he's paraplegic. I don't care. Maybe they were a little negligent, but what the hell? I'm not going to raise my insurance rates. And so th these are the people that the uh, defense lawyers uh, look for and thrive on. Um, so coming back to what Kahneman talks about, too, the power of choice. The spotlight theory, you heard this morning about the availability bias. I think the, avail the availability bias is such a huge, huge advantage for us, um, which is that jurors will focus in deliberation where what I call the spotlight theory, uh, jurors will focus in deliberation where the spotlight was placed during trial. Uh, what that means is, and the reason it's an advantage to us because we get to place the spotlight. We get to decide where to put the emphasis. So when you, that's why you don't want to give too much information about your plaintiff. You don't want to overtry your case with an excessive amount of information uh, because the spotlight theory. When, when you go into deliberation, you know the thing that is talked about least in a jury room, this came out of a, years ago, out of a lot of survey of actual jurors in real cases. The thing they talk about the least is physical pain, mental anguish, physical disability, physical disfigurement. I'm not saying they don't talk about damages, I'm saying they don't talk about injuries. And the reason they don't is because a lot of times we don't prove injuries we don't go into detail on proving injuries. We don't go into the, de the detail we need to go into to prove the physical pain and the mental anguish and the physical disability and the physical disfigurement. So you need to put the spotlight on this. Every element of damage requires its own individual body of proof. So we take the element of physical pain and suffering. We'll go into a war room and we'll write it right up here physical pain and suffering. And then under that, under that element of damage, we'll write the names of our, we'll write our witnesses. We'll put, we'll look at a body of evidence. We want an entire body of evidence devoted just to physical pain. And you get expert testimony, lay testimony, documentary evidence, demonstrative evidence, and then admissions that you've already got, things that you've already got in. Uh, but then we'll look at that and then we'll make a list of every witness that has anything to say about physical pain that supports our physical pain proof 
And what is that going to be? We'll look at every document that supports physical pain and, and we'll put together that entire body of evidence. When you do that, that's, that's the availability. We make available, make available to the people who are going to determine the value of your case, the data, the evidence about the injury, what your, what your client has to live with for the rest of their life if you've got a, a, a serious injury case. And then, remember this, coming back to compared to what? So when we prove up, when we prove up these injuries and we make this evidence available, we're proving three things. There, there are three elements. Compared to what? What was the plaintiff's physical life before, before the injury? What was their life like before? What is their life like today? And what would their life be like for whatever period of time that they will suffer damages in the future? Because just putting evidence in abstractly doesn't resonate nearly as soundly or nearly as strongly as putting it in comparing to uh, what they were before, because that's, that's the real measure. So the spotlight theory, we get to put the spotlight where we want it. So with that in mind, going back to what we talked about, we want to put the spotlight on the creation of circumstances, the creation, the bad choices that were made by the defense that caused this whole tragedy in the first place. There's your spotlight. The, we, want to put the we want to put the spotlight on the personality of the 18-wheeler driver, the adverse party, whoever the defendant, whoever the bad guy is. We want to put the, it may be a bad corporation. Gee, there are some. Um, you want to put the spotlight on, on whoever the person is that has responsibility at that corporation. So that's the spotlight. And then we want to put to the extent possible without overdoing it, we want to put the spotlight on the, the, the good personality, the good characteristics, the real integrity of our plaintiff. And the fact that our plaintiff did not contribute to the circumstances. Our plaintiff was not a contributor or a creator of the circumstances. Our, cre our plaintiff was what? Reactive. Our plaintiff was reacting to the circumstances created by uh, this defendant. So that way, with the spotlight theory, you take into account the attribution biases, and, and the best way, this is what I love to do. Uh, I love to go to the blackboard, I go to the whiteboard actually in my war room, and we'll write choices. We'll write choices. And we, we put up every choice that the defendant made that contributed to creating the circumstances that caused this tragedy. And we'll put all those choices up there. And, uh, th and that, that's a good starting point. So now, when you get your choices up there and you look at the conduct they did, because of what Kahneman tells us about thinking slow and thinking fast, it's the unconscious mind. It's why I've been talking about this for years, about the difference between the unconscious mind and the conscious mind. When you get those defendant's negligent conduct up there, the bad choices, you reframe the defendant's negligent acts into positive actions. You don't say the defendant failed to do this. You don't say the defendant failed to do this. You say the defendant chose to do this, okay? If you've got a medical negligence case, it's not that the doctor failed to do this. It's that the doctor had these, the doctor had four choices. He could have done A, and you explain what A is and what its purpose is. This test was, was done and how it should have been done. And if it had been done in this case, what it would have shown. He could have done this. No, second choice, he, but he chose not to do it. He could have done this, third choice, but he chose not to do it. He chose instead to send the patient home with literally, literally an aspirin and say, call me if you have any further difficulty. Well, the patient didn't have the opportunity to call him because he was dead. So those are choices. Frame these things in terms of positive choices. Why? Because of the unconscious mind, because of, of what, uh, what Daniel Kahneman refers to as the fast thinking. 
the unconscious mind because those resonate in the unconscious mind, but there are things you need to know about the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind does not process negatives. So when you say, do not do this, the not doesn't register in the unconscious mind. The not, the not has, to be, has to be processed in the conscious mind. So you're wanting to communicate with the unconscious mind, so you don't want the, you don't want the jurors to have to think and process all these things that the plaintiff failed to do. Well, let's see, he failed it. That's got to go up here. No, he chose to do this. Boom, it's in there. It doesn't require any processing. That goes into the fast thinking mind where the decision making takes place. So that's why you rephrase it. You, you go over the multiplicity of defendant's choices. You go into the absence of the plaintiff's choices. He, he left the defendant's conduct, left the plaintiff with no choice, or left the plaintiff with the only choice they had, which is exactly how they responded and what they did. Uh, so the positive outcome, positive outcome, positive outcome, chosen by the defendant, tragic death. So the more choices, again, there's an exacerbating factor in there. The more choices you can show, the more likely you are to increase the damages in the case. So more choices, larger awards, irritation factor. Uh, jurors imagine an alternate scenario that changes some surprising, unusual, or abnormal event. They will try to think up. They will try to think up alternative uh, scenarios that would have, that would change this. So give them those. Give them those. All, go over the alternatives. Cover the alternatives so that they can't say, well, you know what might have happened was this. We hear this so much in focus groups. Well, if you leave it to them, well, what might have happened was this. What might have happened was this. No. Go over the alternatives. Go over what the choices were and show that they didn't happen. Show that that was not a choice. That, 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 close the door. Cover it all. All right, the hindsight bias, uh, the jurors view the outcome as having appeared inevitable. You have to show them that this outcome was not inevitable because if it was, if it was inevitable, it's not the defendant's fault. So you have to show why it was not inevitable by showing the choices they had that would have avoided the outcome. We're starting to get a, hear a theme resonate here about choices. Um, so the, the purpose of attribution, plaintiffs, uh, defendants, bad choices. Reactive attribution, uh, bad conduct by the defendant, plaintiff left with no choices. So when you're, when you're communicating with the fast thinking mind, the unconscious mind, you, you tell your story. This is important as opposed to everything else I've said today. You tell your story in the present tense. You tell your story in the present tense. You tell your story in the present tense. Why? Because the unconscious mind, which is where the decision making and the processing takes place, does not resonate in the past or in the future. The unconscious mind reacts and processes only occurrences in the present tense. So when you write your story, tell your story in the first person. Uh, and, and, but that's a whole different speech, but just take my word for it. Uh, visual images, to reach the unconscious mind, you use visual images. Uh, you, you use colors. You create everything that you can, er, er, you use every sense you can you can invoke. That's what resonates in the unconscious mind. And then the other thing about the unconscious mind, this is why metaphors, similes, and rhetorical devices are so extremely important. Because a metaphor, straight to the unconscious mind, doesn't have to be processed. Um, so that's why our metaphors, rhetorical questions, same thing, what Paul's just talking about. Those things are processed processed in the unconscious mind, which is where you want them to be. So let's talk one last thing. Uh, the one last guy we haven't mentioned, aside from Kahneman and, <coughs> and Lee Ross, um, is Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson was the father of a lot of this. He's the guy who taught us about 
the, the importance of verbal, nonverbal, and vocal communication, and how you have to have a synthesis between your verbal story, your nonverbal story, and your vocal story. The vocal is so important because, um, as I've told you many times, the words we use, the, vocal, uh, the verbal is only 8% of the delivery of your message. The nonverbal communication is 55% of the delivery of your message because why? Back to Kahneman now. All that stuff happens in the unconscious mind. All that is being processed in the fast thinking mind. The vocal, the vocal, we, it is 37%. That sounds like a lot, but you know one of the things? The vocal is so important because for one thing, sincerity, your sincerity will resonate out of the vocal as much as anything else, out of the vocal and out of eye contact. It's where the sincerity. And they've got to, you have to be sincere. I asked Larry Smith, who our, our dear departed friend who wrote much of this stuff. I said, Larry, what is the most important one single thing that you can tell me about persuasion? What's the most important thing? He said, sincerity. If you can fake that, everything else falls in place. So, now what, what Erickson taught us was if you have, if your vocal and if your nonverbal actions are not in accord with the words you're using, the nonverbals are going to prevail every time. And if the nonverbals prevail, that means they're rejecting your words. That means the words you're using are a lie. Okay? So that's why all this is so extremely important. Um, have I got one minute? Oops, I don't. Okay, so that's absolutely everything I know about Kahneman and all this sort of thing. So I'm going to um, tell you to go enjoy the rest of the convention. I hope you've gotten a lot out of this because we put, we, we've, we've waited a long time to put together the Kahneman program, and I hope you've gotten a lot out of this today and the tremendous job that was done by, by the speakers. So we hope we've said, said something today that will help you help your clients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Howard. As usual, terrific.